evening. evening. Got quiet. I figured it was a good time to start, right? And it's 7 o'clock. So I invite you to turn with me in your hymn books to number 170. Number 170, welcome to Shannon Hills Bible Chapel for our special meetings. Uh, But we'll begin our singing with number 170, One Day. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, our example is he. Number 170. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men by example. You need a little extra air, you know, when on that on that chorus to get the volume. I know you just had this wonderful meal, and it's hard to get air while you're sitting. So why don't we stand? Said all that to say this. Why don't we stand to sing verse three of one day? One day they left him alone in the garden. One day.
be seated. I'd like to ask our brother Stephen Roten if he would open our meeting in a word of prayer. Steve. Father, we thank you so much that we have this hope that Christ is coming. We thank you that we have the hope of the gospel in our hearts as well, that we will be like him we will see him as he is. But Father, right now, tonight, we come, we open our hearts, open our minds. We want to hear, we want to see, we want to experience and know Christ. To know him more, to love him, to truly love him in every way. And Father, just do a mighty work within us, Lord. We come tonight willing to, for you to change us however you want. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue our singing with number 495. 495, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Okay. 
Thank you again. I'd just like to draw your attention to a few announcements um, from the bulletin. One is, of course, be here tomorrow night. And uh, you, can all, you can also check out the menu for the rest of the week. It's in, the, it's in our bulletin. Tomorrow night is uh, baked spaghetti and then chicken pie on Wednesday and tacos. I thought we were supposed to have tacos on Tuesdays. I thought that's how that worked. But they're on Thursday this week. But uh, don't pick your night you're coming because of the meals, but for the ministry that we have. Uh, hopefully we'll be here every night that you, that you possibly can. Uh, also, just uh, a couple things to mention. We are planning to have a baptismal soon. Encourage any believers who have not been baptized to speak with an elder who is interested in that. And also, uh, they're updating the chapel directory. Um, there's a notebook on the table in the hallway that uh, you can make any changes, check the listings, and make your, sure if yours is correct. So uh, that's out of the building. Also, the upcoming is the National Workers and Elders Conference. It's going to be here in October. Now you're like, well, that's a long way away, Stephen. But we need to go ahead and get housing arranged for those who come to it and want to ha need need housing. And if you can help with this, um, they really are needing some help. So far, they have seven homes. Just to give you an idea, I know as early as it is, there's more people signed up that need housing that we've already had people signed up for housing. So that's how uh, in need we are. They want to know by the end of April if you can help see Ronnie or Patty Murdoch for that, um, if at all possible. So just strongly encourage if you can house some people for that, let them know. One more quick opportunity to sing before our brother comes, number 521. Number 521. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through His infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed. fine singing tonight and for our instrumentalists for playing for us. It is my privilege now to turn our the remaining of the meeting to our brother Steve Price. Well, good evening to you. Um, I'm hoping I did not underdress because I only brought like one tie. I only own two ties and I already used one. So, so forgive me if I've insulted you by my lack of a tie. Now, what I want to do tonight is we want to spend some time uh, speaking about the Lord Jesus. And I'm going to introduce this in a very uh, personal way. But uh, before we start, I think it would be of, of great importance to seek his face. Let's pray. Our Father, how do you talk about your son? What, what words can the human language come uh, generate to, to give him his rightful due? I'm afraid, Father, that the language that we have would fail us to speak of your Son in the manner that he so deserves to be consistent and commensurate with his glory. 
Thus, we ask that the Spirit of God would do what can't be done by human means, and that He would teach us about Your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it says in the Scriptures that there was no form or comeliness that we should desire Him. That's an Isaiah quote. Can you imagine that? You know, that means that when you were a teenager at this local synagogue with, with the Lord Jesus, you didn't think he was very special at all. In fact, you probably thought he was a little gangly. There wasn't anything that was physically impressive about the Savior. We think he was probably a strong man because he was a carpenter, but that doesn't always equate. He just was ordinary. There's a little image of this in the Old Testament on the Day of Atonement when the high priest who normally had ornate, intricately woven garments with threads of gold and of, of, uh, of uh, uh, threads of, of royal blue, he would put on a linen white garment and blend in with everyone else. I think that would have been a measure of the Lord Jesus. Why didn't he have any notoriety or fame prior to the uh, uh, coming of the Holy Spirit by the, the baptism with John? Is it true that maybe as some make conjectures, such as in the book of Thomas, that he did wizardry as a child? No, I think he was ordinary. I think if you were to go to a classroom and pick out the most gifted, he would not have been in that group. You might even think he probably doesn't have a chance to make it. He might be the most unlikely to succeed. So when the disciples and the people of that day got acquainted with the Lord Jesus, they might not have been impressed. Even though it was Andrew who brought his brother Peter to meet the Messiah, fully convinced, I love Andrew, a very, very easy believe guy, he, he brought his brother to meet the Lord Jesus, claiming that he was possibly the Messiah, but you know, they just didn't follow him right away. It was about a year later that the Lord Jesus met him on the Sea of Galilee in Luke chapter 5 and taught them, uh, taught the audience where they could hear the, the teaching of the Savior, and he calls them to follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If he was really, truly impressive at the onset, they probably would have followed him from the day of the baptism, days of the baptism of John. So when we look at the Lord Jesus, we might not think he's all that spectacular. Oh, Steve, that's so heretical. Of course we think Jesus, the Lord Jesus, is spectacular. Do you now? Do you? You see, he's been taking a lot of negative press lately. Those in the world of academia have claimed that he is a, a fictitious character generated by a fanatical group of people called Christians who sat in a room together and conjured up this char character, Jesus, who is bigger than life but really was only a mere man. He's been taking a lot of heat today on that. Professors write those books makes you wonder about the definition of professor. You, you have this, this sort of dumbing down of the Savior, and, and so he becomes sort of one of the guys, one of the friends you hang out with, one of the people that you might seek as a consultant, but you don't have to take his advice because, after all, it's ju he's just a consultant, and he can, he can give some good advice, but I don't have to follow everything. Don't be ridiculous. It's my decision. And what happens to the Christian today is the view of their Christ, is the view of the Lord Jesus becomes diminished, becomes depressed, becomes less than who he is. And do you know what the Bible calls that? Idolatry. Oh, Steve, I do not have a Buddha in my house. No, but we portray the same mindset. We bring, as they did in the days of Israel, the Lord Jesus down to a level common with humanity, common with our folklore, common with our mythology, and he is treated, he is regarded, he is acted upon as if he's just one of the many. And I'm afraid 
the Christian is the most guilty party. Now, it's done so subtly. It's done in how we react to our trials, who you turn to first. When something happens, do you immediately go into your mind of how to solve the problem, or do you immediately seek the face of your God? When, when there's a tension moment, do you seek how to resolve it and get all the ducks in the row in the workplace or in the school place so that your life is solved with this, the, relieved of this tension and you've never sought the one who bears your anxieties? You see, we act as if he's one of the many. We have a low view of Christ. And a low view of Christ generates a low view of the head of the church, and having a low view of the head of the church means that you could probably take his place. And my friends, that is so dangerous. So in our little mini-series of Christology, a look at the Lord Jesus, tonight we're going to begin with something that will put him in his place, and it's called the deity of Jesus Christ. Now I want to warn you, we're going to get technical. So if you get that glazed look of yourself in the front row, you eight people there, don't worry, I will call you out. I'm, I'm looking at you, looking at you. Okay. But it will be technical. We will exercise ourselves in some, some passages. But when we're done, my goal, my prayer, is that Christ would not be one of the boys when somebody speaks his name, you'll sit up straight. Did you know that's how it was in Japan? My mother used to tell me this, that when, and when she grew up in the 30s and 40s there, when the emperor's name was mentioned on the radio, everybody would sit up straight at the table. The emperor wasn't even there. You know, today when we hear the Lord Jesus' name, we kind of go, oh yeah, that's funny. We have, no, we have such a low view of Christ. No wonder the world doesn't think Christianity, Christ-likeness, is anything to, to desire. We can't even keep our Savior in the right degree of homage and respect and adoration as he deserves. Why would we expect an unbeliever to want to even come to a church where Christ is preached? He's not special. We need to change that. That's actually called revival. So let's begin. John 1.1 1, 1 is where we're going to go. Now, are you ready to get technical? Here we go. This is your foreign language. It's mine is English, yours is Greek. And we're going to try to go through this in just a small detail because it is important for establishing the very first point that our God, our Jesus, is indeed God. Now, you'll say to me, I've heard that all of my life. I, why do I need to prove it? Because there are those out there who are using this very text to disprove it. So it reads as follows, En arche en ha lagas, kai ha lagas en pros, or pros, ton theon, kai theos en ha lagas. Now, if you are of a different pronunciation of the Greek language, or if you know Erasmian, you know that I slaughtered it. But it sounded so good. This is the translation for you. And it's uh, written uh, from the Greek as the main line. So it says, in the beginning, the word the beginning is arche, that's the second word. Uh, ain, or ain is was, so that's a past tense, the word. Ha lagas. Kai is and. Ha lagas. Again, en again, or en is was. Pros, or it's actually pros, to or with the God. Right? And you can see the second line there. And God was the word. Now open your text, all right? Open your Bibles to John chapter 1. And I'm going to read it, and we're going to compare it with the actual word order in the original language. Are you ready? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's wrong with that? Read it in your text and compare it to what's behind me. Do you see the difference? Where's the difference? What's that? That's right. The difference is right, ah, there it is, right here, this clause right there. We've reversed the order, haven't we? 
Did you see that? Now, in order for us to understand this, I'm going to take apart a few words, and then I want to put it back together. Now, this is that moment in this message where you go, oh, my goodness, we're doing calculus at 7 o'clock at night. Yes, we are, but it's not as bad as you think. First of all, you see this word pros? Uh, it's this word over here. I'll point it out to you right somewhere. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Okay. What happened to my light? Okay, there it is, right there. See that word? Okay, that's a preposition. And the preposition speaks of direction, moving toward someone. It bespeaks of closeness because you've moved in that direction. It bespeaks of proximity. Therefore, we use English prepositions that sound like to, like unto, among. That is the idea of proximity, with, closeness, and, and in. And uh, I mean, like in the same room, kind of togetherness. And so what he says there is that the word, that's the, the halagas, or halaga, halag, halagas, he is it, saying that word is toward, with, among, in the God. You see that word uh, tain, or tone? Uh, excuse me, it's pronounced tan. That word uh, over here on the very end, right there, T-O, this one right there, T-O-N, that word is the definite article for um, God, which is theos, and it's in the accusative. Now, you're going to say to me, accusative, oh, I'm getting a headache. All right, let me give you a couple of pointers real quick. It's very, it's very interesting, actually. The accusative is what we call the um, direct object. So if you write a sentence, it says, um, I threw, all right? Well, what'd you throw? The ball. So the ball is the direct object. I, uh, I, the subject, did the action throw or threw, and I did, I actually threw something, and it was the ball. So when we speak, we, in English, we say um, subject, verb, object. It can be indirect or direct. In, in Greek, the accusative is the direct. Now, what he's saying is the word was, that's the verb, the God. And the reason why that uh, article, T-O-N, is there is because it's telling you it's in the accusative case. Now, when the article's used in the Greek language, it is actually referring to identity. So he's saying the word, that's Jesus, uh, is with, combined, close proximity, among, uh, attached to, if you will, the God. Right? You see that? That's a simple sentence. Now, when you change, now the normal word order in Greek is not subject, verb, object. It's verb, subject, object. So we, Greek switches the two. That means that when you move a part of the sentence to the front of the sentence, that means the author thinks that's important for you to notice first. And you see that last clause, the akai theos, ein ha lagas, lagas, that will, uh, the second or the middle sentence there, and God was the word, that puts the object, that's God, in the front of the sentence, of the clause. So he's saying God was the word. He's trying to get you to understand what he's implying by using the title God. Now, if you notice also in this little illustration, we had, oh, I wish this would work for me. There it is. We had this article here, but it's not here. You see, it's absent. There's no article there. Um, in Greek, there's only the article the. There's never the indefinite article a or a, a n or an. So it's the or nothing, and it's missing. Now, when you don't have that definite article, it implies that he's speaking of the quality of the entity being addressed. Well, who is, uh, who, who, is, who is God? Well, we'd say he's deity, right? That's a quality about him. So really what he's saying, and listen to this close, deity was the word. Did you catch that? 
we say the word was God, right? And when we change that word order, we diminish the emphasis of deity is actually the word. It's not talking about identity. We've established that over, on, uh, over here already, but it's talking about who this God is, what makes him up, what is his quality of being, and deity is, is then said to be the Jesus. Now, if you've ever talked to a Jehovah Witness, they change this sentence too. And the way they change it is they say, and the word was a God. Now, the problem is, is that there's no indefinite article in the Greek language, and so you can't really translate the little letter A. But you notice when you tr say it and translate it as they do, they're really opening the door to say that many can become a God. So, the word Jesus was a God, like the rest of us can be, and that's their theology, right? But they've gone with the King James or the English word order, and then they added a something that shouldn't be there, and it totally destroys the real thrust of the passage that deity is the word, is Jesus. Now, this may not be important to you, but it's really important to me because I need you to understand that when we talk about the Lord Jesus, we're talking about God walking with two feet in front of you. Let me see if I can give you a very poor illustration. I was um, a month ago in New Jersey, and I, my host was a fellow who's 98 years old and he was going to be 99 and he lived in an independent living home and he would take me down to the little cafeteria there his name is Fred some of you may know him he's one of the original board members of CMML so we're down there and and we're eating one morning and and I said so um do you did you happen to uh, ever hear H.A. Ironside you know H.A. Ironside he's one of our people right and he writes a lot and he writes good stuff and he looks at me and says, oh, yeah, I've had dinner with him back in the day. I go, what? I said, so I thought, well, let me up the ante. I said, have you ever met E.P. Gibbs? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, I heard him preach many times, sat in the front row. I thought, oh, can I have your autograph? See that? Mere men. Mere men, and I'm not even meeting the original version. I'm meeting somebody who had dinner with him, and I'm breaking out in a cold sweat. That's pathetic, I might add. But, but we don't do that with the Lord Jesus, and he is so much bigger, brighter, and greater than a man. But we would never think about giving him that kind of emotional, visceral reaction. We just think he's, oh, yeah, Jesus, yeah. See, that's the problem of, of a, a world that has no respect for the Savior. He's treated as common, and guess what happens to the Christian? We think the same way. That's what's happening, and that has to change. All those letters to the churches of Revelation, the Lord Jesus presents himself and elevates the audience's impression and opinion of Christ to a higher level. And I touched on some of that by the grace of God yesterday. The faithful, the true, the one who has the keys of the doors which no one will, no one will open, no one will close, uh, uh, the, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Those titles are not just some sort of badge of honor, a verbal gold medal on the breastplate of Christ. They are meant to speak to us in such a way that we no longer think of him on the level of idolatry, one of the gods, but the God. Now, our culture has done a lot to foster this, and one of the things they've done is they made a series of, of movies that I think every young person has seen, and, and, and it's that, you know, the, the idea that in those Marvel movies, uh, this guy is, 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 a, is a deity, you know, can be a god. And you can be a god too. No, you can't. 
No, you can't. You will never be that. And there's only one God, and His name is Jesus the Christ. And He has such notoriety and such impressiveness. He has such great power, such great movement, such great poise, such great grace that He, above all other people on this planet, should have your absolute undivided attention so that you never break eye contact with the Savior. But we do that. No, no, no. We need to know Jesus Christ. Now, I put up uh, here are the things that I mentioned. You know, God here, there's no article, refers to the quality of God. Uh, of course, the article used above, and, and I tried to hopefully put that in, in English. Now, I want you to look at a couple of other things. Turn to 1 John chapter 1, all right? And this is in the, uh, the storyline of looking at our Christ and seeing who he really is. All right? So if you look in 1 John chapter 1, I will read it. Now, I've arranged this text so that you can see the structures of speech, okay? So before I read it, I'm going to bring your attention to this. I want you to see, I think I need new batteries, that's the problem. I want you to see, see that ACC up there? See that word? ACC, ACC, ACC. That's dealing with a pronoun, which. It's a relative pronoun, and it's used, uh, nor, it can be used as the subject of the sentence, but in this case, it's used as the object of the sentence. Remember what I said. It's normally verb, subject, object, but if you take that object and you put it in the front of the sentence, the author, same author, John, is saying, I want you to catch this. I want you to see something, All right? And so he moves all the objects, the accusatives, in the front part of the sentence. And the main verb doesn't come for about a verse and a half later. Now let's read it. Are you ready? It goes like this. That which was from the beginning, see that word which, which we have heard, see that word, which we have seen with our eyes, see that, three in a row, with four now, which we have looked on and our hands have handled and con concerning the word of life. And here's the main verb. The life was manifested. Now, uh, he says was manifested, that means revealed, and then he says, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now, wait a minute. Did you catch it? The life was revealed, and this life was with the Father. That was revealed too, so it has to be that this life is of the Father. That is, the deity of Christ is expressed again. But what I want you to see is the whole idea of putting the objects in the front of the sentence. And you can see up there, or see in the previous uh, slide, it was which, I'll read it, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. Now, here's the interesting part. What John is doing is he said, not only did we hear the teaching of the Savior? Not only did we see that He was God, the Word was, in, the Word was God, or God was the Word, but we put Him to the test, and we used everything scientifically available to us to analyze and, and experiment with the Savior. You see, that's what science is about. What science does is they take everything which is measurable, you can use your senses to measure, which I would add is not always a reliable a reliable barometer, but nonetheless, we use our touch, we use our taste, we use our feel, we use our sight, our smell, and then what we do is we take a, 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 an entity and we analyze it in the lab, we heat it up, we break it down, we knock off parts, we weigh them, and then all of a sudden we, we begin to uh, see what makes up an object, right? And what John is saying is we've taken the most reliable scientific instruments we have, all the senses of the human frame, which measures everything around you, and we applied it to the Lord Jesus, and when we applied it to the Lord Jesus, the only scientific discovery we made was that Jesus is God. God. You hear that? Don't you love how it's very poetic what he said? 
And he's saying that if I've done that, if we've done that, and we live with him for those three years, and we walk with him, we talk with him, we were fed by him, we saw when he got up, we saw when he went to bed, we saw when he had to use the bathroom, we saw when he had to get dressed in the morning, we saw everything about the human makeup of this person, and we concluded that he was not a human being. He was not just a human being, excuse me. He was God. That should cause in us, like my reaction with Fred, a tremendous swell of admiration in you and I. Can you imagine walking around with the Lord Jesus? Somebody comes up to him and says, Jesus, Jesus, can you make my eyes see? Jesus said, you can see. I mean, you're, you're walking around with, how do I say this politely, uh, the rock star of his day. And you, you, you would go along and somebody say, Jesus, Jesus, we need bread, we need bread. Can we not have some crumbs from the table? Your daughter is made well. Jesus, oh, Jesus, can you, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Will you make me clean? Oh, I'm so willing. Be clean. Can you imagine walking around with a person like that, day in and day out, sun up to sundown, and even at bedtime, deep into the night, everybody and their brothers coming to see Jesus. Some people came to be healed. Some just wanted to, to look at this marvelous humana, uh, human being with great humanitarian effort. You see, that's your Jesus. That's your God. And you need to think of him in a way that is at, at every bit as, as, as honoring as your most popular uh, uh, um, uh, figure in, in current history, whether it be your favorite musician or your favorite movie star or your favorite president. And guess what? He is so far above them, you would be ashamed to even think you had another favorite. But we don't think that way. We don't have this appreciation of Christ. We need it. We need to understand who he is and what he does because who he is. We need a high view of Christ. The world can, and Satan can so easily knock us down when we don't have a high view of Christ. Maybe the, the trials come and we get ridiculed because uh, we cannot uh, bear under the trial, and it's because our view of Christ is so diminished. Let me give you an example. Many people know Elizabeth Elliot. No one knows of Maria Short. Maria Short was a missionary with Elizabeth Elliot when she lost her husband, Jim Elliot. Maria Short was for a time in the uh, assisted care home in Claremont, California called the Western Assemblies Home. I get to go out there once in a while and I was staying there having breakfast with Maria Short one day and she just started to talk. And you know what I learned to do when somebody older than me starts to talk? I learned to shut up and I just listened. And she told me that when Elizabeth Elliot lost Jim Elliot, she was with Elizabeth when they went back to get her things from that uh, area in the jungle. And she described what Elizabeth Elliot went through, and she described how she was a faithful friend. She described the mission work that they, that they had done together, even the work with other missionaries on that team. And I said, well, what happened to you, Mrs. Short? She said, well... We were in need of some funds, and so my husband began to work on the coast. One day, I woke up and learned that he had another wife and children on the coast. Boy, the whole world just got jerked out from underneath her, right? She said, I said, what did you do? Well, I, I told him I couldn't live like that. So I came back to California. I had the three children with me. I went back to school, got my teacher's certificate, and I worked the next 50 years providing for my family. I thought, wow. You went out as a young person wanting to be a missionary, thinking about all this, this, this adventure as a life of the missionary, and everything that you thought got popped with one pen. 
One pin popped the balloon. And I said to her, Mrs. Short, did you ever get bitter at God? You know, this is what she did. I'll never forget it. <gasps> no, no. And then she looked at me, and I, I think I'll start crying. She said, I could never be bitter at the Savior who loved me. That's a high view of Christ. That's what we need. That's why I'm looking at his deity. Because when you think about it, you are walking around with the greatest man that has ever lived, is living, and will ever live. And he needs to occupy so much of your affection that when the bottom drops out of your life, you won't begin to think that Jesus is not who he says he is. The last thing in, you, in the world you would ever do is blame him for your problems. Do you understand where I'm coming from? So, let's move on. So they said, I, I checked it all out, and I can tell you that this life that was in front of us was the life of God right in front of us. Now I want you to turn to John chapter 1 again and verse 14. These are classic scriptures about the deity of Jesus Christ, and I'm, I'm trying to get you to see it in such a way that it is more than just an academic discussion. It is a discussion that will affect your vitality. Think about how this will undo so many things for you and I. Now, I want you to see this. It's uh, John 1, 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among, a, among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. We're going to look at this for a second. Now, the word became, do you see it and behind me? It's, and the word became flesh. That's genomai. And what it means is that you acquire or experience something. You become into existence. You didn't give birth, but you, you, you exist in some fashion. So when it says the word became flesh, it doesn't imply a starting point per se. It implies a continuance. And the word existed in the flesh. You see that? Now, there's a different word for give birth. That's ganao. That's the word uh, at the end of the paragraph there. It's not that word. So when he says this word genomai, he's really saying, I have existed. I am is the idea. Now, the second word is dwelt among, among us, skenao, skenao. And it means to reside, settle in a defined specific place, that I'm in this location, I'm in this space, I'm in this residence, I'm in this, this, this uh, um, housing. And what he's saying is the word became, that is, existed in the, in the tent or a house called the flesh, and then decided to take up residence, make space among you and I. Now, when that happened, we had an unusual sight. We saw, and here's the word here, we beheld his glory. Now, the word beheld is theaomai, and what that means is that we held a long gaze at something. I do that when I see my wife. I look at her like that. You know, my kids are going, Dad, Dad, you're staring. I said, you bet I am. All right? You see, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing you do when you do a double take, you know. You know, you're, you're intently, and it's catching your eye, not just for a moment of ADD, but a, a moment where you're sort of taking in the beauty, taking in the perspective, taking in the grandeur. It's kind of like when you come across a sunset like that. And he's saying, that's what we did. You see, when Jesus took on, became the flesh, he didn't, he didn't uh, deity took on humanity, then what happened is we were using our senses, and one of them was our eyesight, and we looked over our shoulder and we went, what? See that? Now, what we saw was the glory of the Father. The glory, word glory means doxa. It means brilliance. It means brightness. 
Now, it's very graphically demonstrated to you in the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 18, where the Lord Jesus went up the mountain, probably Mount Hermon, and, and when they got up there, he was transfigured, that is, the flesh that you'd normally see, the skin, the bones, and the acne was all there, and yet, in that moment, what, was, what had taken on flesh disrobed itself of flesh. And you could see the brilliance of God. Now, an Old Testament raised Jewish boy would understand this glory thing because in the Old Testament, it uses the word Shekinah, which is the Hebrew word, the Shekinah glory, the glory, the brightness, the brilliance, the fire, if you will, that was the Lord God when he would descend in a pillar of a cloud when he was on the top of Mount Sinai and the thing was shaking left and right and smoke and thunder, lightning and voices that... Where'd they come from? Those were such frightening sights, such brilliant sights that in that day when the glory of the Lord descended and Solomon inaugurated the temple, the priests could not go in because it was so bright. You and I get a tiny taste of that when we go out from a dark room, maybe this building on a bright, sunny, uh, sun-filled day at noon, and we can't see, we're, 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 we're blinded. That's the idea. We were blinded by the brilliance of God in our presence. Well, John, what did you see? I saw a man that could be as bright and glorious <coughs> as the day, sunlight in the day and as humble as a servant who would, without any clothes on, wash dirty men's feet. That's glory. I could see the Savior in all of his demonstrative ways where he would weep when Mary wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Don't you love that? Martha comes, and she's kind of academic. Uh, I know, Lord, that in the last day he'll be raised again, and the Lord Jesus says, well, if you want to be academic, I can too. What you, now, you trust me in what you know. Trust me in what you don't know. But when Mary comes along, same verbiage, different emotional reaction. She is weeping. She's bawling. She's crying. And Jesus, he's moved with compassion. He goes to the tomb, and he starts crying. That's glorious. That's glorious. I don't care who you are. If you're telling a story in a group of friends and you start to weep, we all reach out to you. The Lord Jesus, he saw Mary weeping. He saw the moment. He reached out to her. That's glorious. That's a God who's touched by the human frame and never diminishes his godhood. It tells you how sensitive your God is. It tells you that God walks among his people and he feels your in injury and pain. He feels your sorrow. He feels your, your joys. He feels your, your, your love. and he, the, Everything about you, he's got a beat on you. That's our God. That's our Jesus. We need to quit sort of apologizing for Jesus. we got to quit sort of apologizing that, that, you know, he's our central figure of Christianity. But, you know, he's not really that crazy. What are you talking about? This is the perfect man. And we need to understand him that way. We need to see him that way. We need to live if he's that way. He's not our, he's not our little stepbrother that we want to hide in the closet because we're embarrassed about him. No, Where's the, that's, that's, not, that's not life more abundant. That's, that's living in secrecy. And saints, well, that has to be different. The only way it can change is if we see the Lord Jesus in all of his glory. And I'm hoping this week we'll unpack some of that glory. And what will happen will be what, will be what has happened to the disciples John wrote about it about 40, 50 years later. All I can tell you is we took the time to think this through, to look at him, to talk with him. And boy, I tell you, I, he, he's nothing like the God I had in my mind. I thought the God I had in my mind was, was si sort of irritable and doesn't like anybody walking on the grass. And so, you know, get off the grass. But that wasn't Jesus. No, 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 we would walk through the fields and we'd pluck the grain and we'd eat it. And all those Pharisees came up and told Jesus that he was wrong. Jesus could have just breathed on him. They would have knocked over. And it wasn't because he had bad breath either. But he didn't. One day somebody came and they were, they were doing other miracles. And, and I, uh, I said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from that? He was shocked I said that. He says, I don't think like that. 
And then there's that moment when we were in the Garden of Gethsemane, and all those 50 men came upon us, and they had clubs, and they had weapons, and we were sitting ducks, and we thought we were going to lose our lives. So I took out my dagger, and I went for his throat, and I got his ear. I'm a fisherman. How can I go for the throat? And Jesus said, put it away. I thought he would be delighted. I was keeping my word. I was going to fight to the death. And he told me to put my sword away. He mentioned something about the angels, and I didn't know about them. Then he picks up that ear and puts it on straight, probably better than it was the first time. This is glorious, you see. This is your Christ. And he's not some dead figure who's isolated off in some galaxy. He is the Christ of the living church, the living God, who resides in your presence on a regular, routine basis. He never has a break with your company. Did you know that? I think we need a high view of Jesus. Let's move on. Okay, I just want to warn you that that little sign there says I have two and a half minutes We're not going to make it. All right, what do I mean by all this? There are two natures, right? Christ is both divine, and as I mentioned, it was genomai. He took on, existed flesh. Flesh, humanity did not become divine. Divinity incorporated humanity. Because he's eternal, he will always have that eternality or the eternal humanity with him. It's, he, it wasn't two separate natures. He didn't transfer traits of humanity to godness and back and forth. Two natures resident within the same person, not two gods, they're resident. And there are times you'll see the humanity of the Savior. He got thirsty, he got tired, and yet there are other times in which there is just the deity of God and making the blind see, making the lame walk, calming the seas. That's the Lord Jesus, and, and he's, he's both. And whatever angle you look at him, you might see one more prominent than the other, but I'm telling you, his natures are perfectly balanced, non-transferable. He knew exactly who he was at all points in time and lived it with perfect righteousness. Never used his great abilities to foster some political agenda. Never got forced into being made king over the world so that he could put down the Roman Empire. No, he, only, he had the character to handle all of the, of, the, uh, of the greatness that he is. You give a man or woman greatness today, they immediately become corrupted. But not the Lord Jesus. Perfect man. Perfect man. All right, there's fourfold testimony. Let's turn to this, all right? I want you to turn with me to John chapter 8 uh, first, okay? This, I, I want you to know that we are in the home stretch, so do not, do not fall asleep. Front row, how you doing? I didn't even spit on you today, okay? That's good. All right, now there's fourfold testimony, all right? Jesus is talking, and in John 8, the first testimony is he witnesses for himself, okay? Now, I'll just read it here briefly, John verse 8, verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. They're saying, you, you, you can't tell us what you're telling us because you're the one saying it. You, you, of course you're going to say that. Jesus answered and said, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. I'm not lying. I'm, I'm being totally honest with you. There is nothing I'm hiding, for I know where I come, came from, and I know where I'm going, but you do not know where, you, where I came from nor where I am going. He says, I I am actually certain of my existence, certain of my my homeland. I'm certain of it all, but you're not. So when I'm telling you this, that I am God, I'm not making it up. It's really true. But they say, hey, yeah, well, you know, you're 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 really just uh, you you you. It's 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 illegal to give your own testimony. Really? When was that a rule in the court of law? I mean, the whole thing is you got to get up and testify in the court proceeding. Well, then, then he says, well, if you don't believe me, believe the Father. And he says that in the next clause. He says, yet, and yet, uh, verse 16, I do, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father. Look at verse 18. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. The Father testifies. Now, how did the Father testify of him? It was validated by, his, by the works that were done. Look over, I think it's, uh, let's see, 
It's in chapter 5. Look in John chapter 5 in verse 36, all right? Look at that for a minute. And you'll see it this. But I have a greater witness than John. Sorry, sorry, I got there too fast. You ready? John chapter 5 and verse 36, okay? I have a greater witness than John. You'll find that John was the third uh, fold witness, but he says this for now. The works which the Father has given me to finish... The very works, the, the very works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. He's saying the reason why I know my Father is testifying of me is because He is letting these miraculous, godlike actions happen on the planet. And even Nicodemus understood it. No man can do the things that you're doing unless he's sent from God. Jesus said, You're right. Ergo, I'm from God. You see what he's saying? And so you got the witness of the Lord Jesus by his own testimony. You have the witness of the Father by miracles. And, of course, you have the testimony of John. Back in chapter 5, if you look in verse 32, it says this. It says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Verse 32, there is another who bears witness of me, and I know that witness which he witnesses of me is true. You have sent to John. That's the witness. John came, and he was announcing the coming of the Messiah. And guess what? The Messiah came. And what John said, he said, you know, I do this and I do that, but he's going to come and he's going to baptize you with this and that and the other. And guess what? That happened. So John's witness was there. And finally, the testimony of the prophets. If you look in chapter 5 down to roughly the end of the chapter, he says in verse 45, do not think I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you. It's Moses. Moses for testimony of me. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So all those documents that you say you're holding to, you're missing the main thing. They're talking about me, that I am. God. They just could not wrap their minds around that. In fact, they hated it so much, they said the exact opposite. They spun it around the exact opposite and said, well, your father is the devil. You do these things by the power of Beelzebub. They spun it the whole way. This is what the sinful mind does. When you can't fight it, you change it to be a lie. And that's what they're doing. Now, what's happened, saints, is the lies about the Lord Jesus have infiltrated the Christian today. And they, they may not think he is as false as what the world says, but you might begin to think that the Lord Jesus is less than trustworthy as you once thought he was. See, that was, I don't know if you saw it online, but that was the testimony of my little 11-year-old when she had appendicitis last year. We posted the little video of her baptism. It's on Facebook. Now, in my family, you want to be a friend of my wife. Don't be a friend of me. I'll never answer you, right? I have good reasons for that. I'll get into them later. But you want to be a friend of my wife because I want everybody that contacts me to first contact my wife because then it's all on the up and up, right? So she posted the video of, of Gracie, and this is what she said. You know, I said to her last Sunday, I said, Gracie, why do you want to be baptized? And she goes, well... A year ago, I had appendicitis, and I, I just began to think that I, I, I just didn't really trust God. You know, why would he do this to me? I ha, I, if I had a little girl, I wouldn't do that to her. And so I quit reading my Bible. I quit praying. 11-year-old. And then I realized I was go, going away from God, and so I started to pray. I started to read. And I realized I don't have to know everything I just trust him in everything. <laughs> I was crying. She was crying. Everybody was crying. It was really a big cry fest. But she said the most profound theology in about 30 seconds. You see, this is what we need to do. We've got Jesus who's being treated as maybe somebody who's too busy to care as somebody who is overwhelmed with the duties of the universe and can't break away to give you a piece of his time who doesn't return text messages, nor does he return phone calls. He doesn't read email, and he's not on social media. Jesus is distant. And the, uh, whole, the whole time that's being shouted at you and yelled in your ears, you should know that that is a lie. 
This Jesus of yours has a fourfold testimony and all of it's true, and he then is saying to you that the person that walks on the planet, that ate and drank like you, is also the person who is God in the flesh, and you can touch, if you will, the hymn of God. He won't flinch. He won't run away. He won't consider it disrespectful because he never considered it disrespectful when he walked upon the planet. And what he wants the Christian to do is let his deity become central again. Let it hit who he is to be the reigning truth of your soul. It's central to the gospel. Do you remember the lady at the well, John 4? What did he say to her? She, says, she said to him, I know that when the Messiah comes, he'll show us all things. Jesus said, I'm he. I'm that person. I'm God in the flesh. He said that to the man who was born blind and made whole again, and he got ejected out of the synagogue, and Jesus found him, and he, and he said, well, do you, uh, do you want to see the Messiah? He goes, I do, and Jesus said, he's standing right in front of you. You see that? It was central to the presentation of the good news, and the reason why it's central to the presentation of the good news is because it not only implies who he is, but it implies what he came to do, and that came out in the discussion with uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, and he said this, Nicodemus, you want to see heaven? You can't see heaven unless you're born again. Well, how can that be? Well, it's going to be similar to that Old Testament story with a snake on the pole, and people were bit by the snakes. They looked to the pole, uh, raised up on a pole, and they were made well. They had to have faith. They had to uh, trust in my provision, and then their bodies were made whole again. That's what can happen to you, and then you can see the kingdom of heaven. You see that? It all hinges upon his identity and his work. But it's also it's central to our disposition, how we think about him. Remember what Thomas said? Thomas, it was actually a week ago yesterday, in which he was um, uh, in the upper room, and the Lord Jesus appears. Amazing thing. Doors were locked, by the way. So he just appears, and he picks up the very period of the sentence a week before when Peter said, well, if I don't see his hands and I don't put my finger in his side, I'm not going to believe he's raised from the dead. I don't think Peter was actually from the deep south, but it just fit for the moment. Then the Lord Jesus shows up, picks up that very paragraph and says, oh, Thomas, I was, I was passing by the other day, and you mentioned something about side and, 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 and hands. Here you go. Go ahead, touch away, Thomas. You know what Thomas said? My Lord and my God. The deity of Jesus Christ is central to your disposition. He fell down and worshiped the Lord Jesus. Now, that's not the only time this happened, right? It was in that upper room, but it also happened. Jesus was instructing in the mount, or excuse me, in the upper room one day, and, and when he was teaching, he said, he washed their feet, he finished, and he says, now you call me teacher and Lord, but I want as your Lord and teacher the personhood of Christ is to cause a disposition change in your heart, an attitudinal change, where you no longer think of him in an academic way. You no longer think of him as answering the question to the Sunday school manual. You think of him as your master, as your king, as the one that you're willing to die for. This is Christ. And that's what we need. And finally, it's important because it determines our unity. I can't turn to it. You'll have to turn to it later. It's in John 17, verses 20 through 24. But Jesus said, I pray for those who will hear by the word of the disciples that they may be one as we are one. When you say the phrase, as we are one, he's referencing his deity. And when he does that, he's saying, I pray that there, this people, you and I, that's us, he's praying for us, that their oneness would equate to our oneness, our union, that God is in the flesh, that union. And when they do that, it will, not, it will create an internal unity. And I have to ask you, brothers and sisters, if you're struggling with your unity, do you know how badly that is reflecting on the deity of Jesus Christ? a central part of the redemptive plan? This is what he's done. He's linked us at this level. And he says it this way, 
The deity of Christ is central to our witness because the world will see that I am in them and you in me and they will know that I am from you. The Lord Jesus is linking his deity to worldwide witness as shown through the written, through souls which have the written unity of God on their hearts. This is, this affects everything. So you have to ask yourself, what, what is my disposition to him? Is he convenient when I need him? Is he my quick trip? That's a very insulting to God, isn't it? Maybe, maybe, he's, he, maybe I failed to understand how central he is to the whole redemptive process that he's put into place, and maybe I've so diminished his great highness and stature in my mind, in my heart, in our assembly, that I'm just doing whatever I want with the unity because I didn't know it was so related. It's all related. We have unity because God is unified, one God. He, Christ in the flesh, God, deity in the flesh, that, that hypostatic union is a, a mystery of all mysteries, and yet it's equal to the mystery of a bunch of, un, a bunch of saved people coming together and getting along in such a way that the world marvels that people can actually do that. And they'll wonder, where did that come from? How did that happen? And they will say, you will say, well, I met a man. I met a man that actually told me what it means for God to walk in the flesh. And that changed my life. Do you see it? Every bit of it is related. So as we go through the rest of the week, I want to put Christ high. I want you to think about Christ. I want you to be reading the New Testament this week and analyzing Christ and looking at how he handled situations and just his brilliance, his poise as a person, his, his stature as a tremendous Savior. I want you to just elevate him. And you know what will happen? You know what will happen? All of our little problems will be put in the right box. All of our little squabbles will actually dissipate. How can we argue like this in the presence of the king? And all of our little worries will become distant memories. Christ is on the throne. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that this evening, although long, has been a moment where we can think of the Lord Jesus. What a great Savior we have. Lord, I'm, I don't want to be a saint that says a great Savior and I have no idea what that means. I, I, I want to know the greatness of my Savior. And I want to therefore understand one of the great truths that, that the greatness of the Savior is displayed by the depth of, from which he left heaven to become a servant of man. Oh, Lord, capture our attention with him. Let not a single moment escape us this week in which we experience revival in the closet of prayer whereby our Savior, our great Lord Jesus, is greater to us than we ever would have thought before. In Jesus' name I pray.